Yu-Gi-Oh! video games are known for having promotional cards alongside them, at least the physical versions of the games. Although many people usually bought Yu-Gi-Oh! games for the game itself, in some instances people were probably more interested in the promotional cards instead. Due to this, the topic remains an interesting one when looking at it in a historical way, and so in this video we'll be covering the entire history of promotional cards included in Yu-Gi-Oh! video games for the TCG in the North American region. And we'll also be discussing how relevant or not so relevant these cards have been for the TCG. The first Yu-Gi-Oh! video game ever released in North America was Yu-Gi-Oh! Dark Duel Stories for the Game Boy Color, released in March 18, 2002. This game actually had two separate sets of promotional cards. Only the initial release run of the game had the following three cards released. Blue Eyes White Dragon, Dark Magician, and Exodia the Forbidden One. The artworks that you're seeing on screen are the actual artworks that release for these promotional cards. It's funny because a lot of people to this day believe that this artwork of Dark Magician and Blue Eyes White Dragon were first ever released in Starter Deck Yugi and Starter Deck Kaiba. But that's actually not true at all because those decks were released in March 29th, 2002. These versions released 11 days before the Starter Deck versions. While Legend of Blue Eyes had already released these cards, those artworks were actually different. Exodia, however, was the same artwork used, obviously. All three released as Prismatic Secret Rares, a unique type of rarity that would continue to be used for promotion of cards for so many years to come. And as a fun fact, these are some of the priciest video game promotional cards to this day. So if you have these in great condition somewhere in your home, you can sell these for quite a large amount of money. Anyway, all future runs of Dark Duel Stories would end up releasing three different promotional cards instead. Say Are You, Acid Trap Hole, and Salamandra. By looking at what these cards actually do, I feel like I should say something really important right now. Most promotional cards are actually pretty bad cards when it comes to actually using them in duels, and very few of them have ever actually had any competitive relevancy at all. After all, most promos are honestly just for collector's purposes anyway, but throughout this video I'll definitely be mentioning how good or bad each promo card was. From these three, Acid Trap Hole was clearly the best because in early Yu-Gi-Oh! It could at least have some niche use here and there to counter the common monster set. But a 700 attack boost for fire monsters and a vanilla 2500 attack dragon were obviously not going to be useful in any way whatsoever. The next game release was Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories on March 20, 2002, only two days after the release of Dark Duel Stories. The promos for this game were Red Eyes Black Metal Dragon, Harpy's Pet Dragon, and Metal Morph. Red Eyes Black Metal Dragon was and will always be a useless card in duels as it's only 400 attack points stronger than the original Red Eyes Black Dragon and to be quite honest, a Red Eyes equipped with Metal Morph will always be better since it will only have 100 less attack than its metal version and will be able to attack over almost anything due to Metal Morph's attack boost. Metal Morph back in the day was actually pretty useful in some ways as it was a nice strong attack bonus for monsters that could have them attack over almost anything. And Harpy's Pet Dragon wasn't really relevant until 2013 when Harpy Channeler allowed itself to combine with Harpy's Pet Dragon for a powerful and consistent rank 7 Xyz engine. Eventually it released an upgraded retrain to the point where the original Harpy's Pet Dragon is pretty much useless right now. The next game is the Eternal Duel of Soul, which released on October 15, 2002 for the Game Boy Advance. The three promos for this game were Exchange, Graceful Dice, and Skull Dice. Needless to say, they were cool, but not great. All three were used in exciting ways in the anime, which probably prompted Konami to print these as promos because kids were going to absolutely love it back in the day. But the two dice cards were a bit of a letdown in the actual TCG because they were significantly nerfed when compared to their anime counterpart. An exchange is a very unique concept in Yu-Gi-Oh!, but unfortunately not executed in the right way on this card to make it be helpful at all. Moving right along to the Duelist of the Roses, released on February 16, 2003 for the PlayStation 2. The three promos for this game were Alpha the Magnet Warrior, Beta the Magnet Warrior, and Gamma the Magnet Warrior. Being three vanilla monsters makes it pretty obvious why they were never utilized in the TCG, and it wasn't until about 13 years later when the Magnet Warrior archetype could actually be used and make some decent plays through new support. Still though, they were a neat addition to the list of promos because they were iconic Yugi cards at the least. The next game on the list is Yu-Gi-Oh! Worldwide Edition Stairway to the Destined Duel, released on April 15, 2003. The three promo cards for this game were Valkyrion the Magna Warrior, Sinister Serpent, and Harpy's Feather Duster. 
While Volcarion was part of the near useless Magnet Warrior combo back in the day, the other two were some of the best promos ever released to this date. Sinister Serpent became banned due to its constant regeneration and card value to any deck, and eventually received a nerf to get it removed from the ban list. And Harpy's Feather Duster found itself in the ban list too, and it only finally got changed from Forbidden to Limited last year in 2021. Overall, this game had some seriously useful promos. The next game is Yu-Gi-Oh! The Sacred Cards, released on November 4th, 2003 for the Game Boy Advance. The three promos for this game were Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth, Ryoku, and The Gate Attack. From the three, I'd probably say Ryoku was the best, but it definitely wasn't still good, as it was significantly nerfed when compared to its anime version that actually steals half the opponent's life points. The Git Attack was always just an underpowered battle trap, and Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth is one of those cards that, while neat, was probably never summoned by anyone in the history of time, at least until 2018 with the release of Cocoon of Ultra Evolution that helped it tremendously. The next game is The Falsebound Kingdom, also released on November 4th, 2003, but this one was for the GameCube. The three promos for this game were Zoa, Metal Zoa, and Goblin Fan. These promos are commonly regarded as probably the worst set of three out of any ever, as it's pretty obvious that Metal Zoa is just as bad as Red Eyes Black Metal Dragon, Zoa is just a two tribute vanilla monster, and Goblin Fan is specific on what it can counter that is practically near useless in many ways. The next game is Reshuffle of Destruction, released in June 29, 2004 for the Game Boy Advance. The three promo cards for this game were Knight's Title, Dark Magician Knight, and Sage's Stone. These are basically Dark Magician support cards, which was an interesting addition, but also never really utilized. The first two are a fun gimmicky combo, but unfortunately breaks too often, as you need to control a Dark Magician to tribute, and you need a Knight's title in your hand, and all that for only one card to destroy on the field. This technically makes Dark Magician Knight one of the first Garnets in the game, because Knight's title can summon it from the deck or a graveyard, so you definitely don't ever want to draw it. On top of everything already mentioned, Dark Magician Knight is not even a spellcaster, so it can't even synergize with your spellcaster support cards because it's actually warrior type. Sage's Stone is at least a little better because you can summon the Dark Magician from your deck and it doesn't tribute the Dark Magician Girl, unlike what Knight's title does. But it does require you to play both Dark Magician Girl and Dark Magician in the deck, so it can tend to get bricky sometimes. The next three games are Yu-Gi-Oh! Power of Chaos, Yu-Gi-Oh! The Destiny, Yu-Gi-Oh! Power of Chaos, Kaiba the Revenge, and Yu-Gi-Oh! Power of Chaos, Joey the Passion. Back then, PC games were commonly physical games as well, and so they came with promo cards for each. For Yugi to Destiny, the five cards, yes, five cards this time, were Windstorm of Itaqua, Anti-Spell Fragrance, Thousand Knives, Dark Magician, and Karibo. Windstorm of Itaqua is not terrible because I suppose it was a bit versatile back in the day. Anti-Spell Fragrance actually sometimes still sees play to this day in side decks as a counter to spell card heavy decks because it actually counters them pretty well. Thousand Knives is one of the weaker Dark Magician support cards and the last two are, well, just iconic Yugi cards so I don't really need to mention much about these. This artwork of Dark Magician though did make its debut here and it would later be released in other products such as Spellcaster's Judgment Structure Deck. The three promo cards for Kaiba the Revenge were Blue Eyes White Dragon with a different artwork this time, Aqua Chorus, and Seal of the Ancients. None of the other two were great at all, as a small attack boost and seeing set cards on the field weren't going to be game changing whatsoever. And then there's Joy the Passion, which had Red Eyes Black Dragon as an alternate artwork, Sebex Blessing, and Sword of Dragon Soul. Once again, nothing too great here as the sword is only an anti dragon card, and Sebex Blessing is honestly one of the worst light point gain cards ever. The next game is Yu-Gi-Oh! The Dawn of Destiny, which released on March 23rd, 2004 for the Xbox console. The three promo cards were The Winged Dragon of Ra, Dark Sage, and Widespread Ruin. Widespread Ruin was the best of the three because it's similar to Sakuretsu Armor, but it also doesn't target, while Sakuretsu Armor does target. Dark Sage is a fun gimmick deck with Time Wizard and Dark Magician, but to be quite honest, it's one of the worst gimmick decks ever made. And for Raw, well, this version is the unplayable version of Raw, so I can't really judge or rate this card at all. The next game is Capsule Monster Colosseum, released in October 26, 2004 for the PlayStation 2. The three promo cards were Abyss Soldier, Inferno Hammer, and Teva. Teva was just another fun gimmicky mechanic, while Inferno Hammer was at least a one tribute 2500 attack monster with an effect. It, as a car, was at least decent at best. And the Bit Soldier had some effective use with annoying water decks at the time that would continuously bounce cards when combined with cards like Penguin Soldier or Nightmare Penguin. 
Abyss Soldier was actually semi-limited for a format in the TCG. Also, these three cards were released as super rares as opposed to prismatic secret rares, and it was around this time when video game promo cards would mostly only be super rares or ultra rares now as opposed to prismatic secret rares. The next game is Destiny Board Traveler, which released on October 26, 2004 for the Game Boy Advance. The promo cards for this game were MSD Infinity, DD Assailant, and Twin Headed Beast. From the three, DD Assailant was the only good card. It was actually limited on the ban list for a few formats because it was just that good of a monster for monster removal. While Amos D Infinity was a 2 tribute 2500 attack monster with only one attack boost for itself, and Twin Headed Beast was a 1700 attack tribute monster that could only attack twice. Not exactly anything too impressive. Now we'll move on to the World Championship games for the Game Boy Advance, titled Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championship Tournament in 2004, Yu-Gi-Oh! 7 Trials to Glory, World Championship Tournament 2005, and Yu-Gi-Oh! Ultimate Masters World Championship Tournament 2006. For 2004, the three promo cards were Fairy King True Skill, Kinetic Soldier, and Slate Warrior. Slate Warrior was possibly the best of the three because it was a 1900 beat stick with a good effect as well. However, the version of Fairy King Truesdale for this game was actually misprinted, and it stated that as long as it was face up, all plants would gain 500 attack, which included itself. This led people to believe that it was actually a 2700 attack 1 tribute monster, outshining Summon Skull and eventually even later cards such as Frostosaurus or Trans to Magic Swordsman. Sorry to say this, but it was in fact misprinted. Its actual effect requires it to be in face up defense position for its effect to work, which means it wasn't really that good unfortunately. And Kinetic Soldier only counted one type of monster, so it also wasn't a useful card, but fun fact, this card got its name changed many years later to Cypher Soldier, because it was actually part of the Cypher archetype all along. For 7 Trials to Glory, the three promo cards were Silent Swordsman Level 7, Kaiba Man, and Mind Control. The Silent Swordsman mechanic was a fun gimmick, but never competitive. While well, Kaiba Man was helpful toward Blue Eyes decks at the time, but quickly got replaced by better support cards as Konami made Blue Eyes into a full-fledged competitive archetype. And Mind Control is actually a really good one. It's a card that wasn't good back in the day because you couldn't do anything with the monster you controlled, but as Synchro, Xyz, and eventually Link monsters were released, you could do so much with that controlled monster, and this card eventually found itself on the ban list for several years. And for Ultimate Masters, the three promo cards were Golden Homunculus, Helios the Primordial Sun, and Helios Duo Magistus. These were part of a banished engine at the time, but to be quite honest, all were outclassed by Grand Majida Aza in combination with either Banisher of the Radiance, Macrocosmos, or Dimensional Fissure. The next game is Nightmare Troubadour, which released on August 30th, 2005 for the Nintendo DS. The three promo cards for this game were Silent Magician Level 4, Silent Magician Level 8, and Magician Circle. The Silent Magician monsters were fun cards to use, but were always non-competitive. A Magician Circle was also mostly underpowered compared to other cards at the time, so not too much else to say about these. The next game is Yu-Gi-Oh! GX Duel Academy, released in January 10th, 2006 for the Game Boy Advance. The three promo cards for this game were Elemental Hero Necro Shade, Wing Karibo, and Hero Ring. Just by reading these, you can tell that all three of them were very weak, even at the time. Elemental Hero cards in general were fairly underpowered in the early GX era, so I guess it makes sense why these never really saw any play. The next product is a special version of GX Duel Academy called the Yu-Gi-Oh! GX Ultimate Beginner's Pack, released in July 19, 2006. This product includes the game Yu-Gi-Oh! GX Duel Academy, a tutorial DVD, a starter deck, and five promo cards. Because there's a video game included in this product, this technically makes the cards video game promo, so that's why I'm including them in this video. The five promo cards are the five pieces of Exodia, which is actually pretty nice, honestly. The next game is just another version of two games already mentioned, and that's Yu-Gi-Oh! Double Pack for the Game Boy Advance, which released on February 22nd, 2006. This game contains both the Sacred Cards and Reshift of Destruction in one game pack, but its promo cards were simply Knight's Title and Dark Magician Knight, two of the same ones from Reshift of Destruction. The only difference is that this version of the cards are actually super parallel rares as opposed to prismatic secret rares like the Reshift of Destruction version. The next game is Yu-Gi-Oh! GX Spirit Caller, released in January 2nd, 2007 for the Nintendo DS. The three promo cards for this game were Brain Crusher, Hunter Owl, and Mask Chopper. If Brain Crusher was a level 6 monster, it would have been significantly better. Still not great, but at least slightly playable in some fun decks. 
but as a level 7, it's just sadly a really terrible card. Hunter Owl is a mediocre at best, serving only as a wind beat stick with only battle protection, so it doesn't really offer much. And Mass Chopper is a very fun card to use in a deck that revolves around loading it up with equips and destroying monsters and inflicting tons of burn damage to the opponent, but obviously that would only work at the casual level of play. I'll be going a little out of release state order for a bit because I want to cover all the DS World Championship games next, and they are Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championship 2007, Yu-Gi-Oh! GX World Championship 2008, Yu-Gi-Oh! 5D Stardust Accelerator World Championship 2009, Yu-Gi-Oh! 5D's World Championship 2010, Rivers of Arcadia, and Yu-Gi-Oh! 5D's World Championship 2011 over the Nexus. For the 2007 game, the three promos were Spell Striker, Exploder Dragon, and Destiny Hero Disc Commander. Neither of these were actually bad though, which is pretty surprising. Disc Commander was easily the best of the three because of its effect that could be abused easily to the point where it would receive an errata to nerf its effect. Spell Striker is a free inherent special summon that you can use for extra deck plays, and Exploder Dragon is a one for one when it comes to destroying an opponent's monster. For the 2008 game, the three promos were Deep Diver, Burden of the Mighty, and Dimensional Prison. Deep Prison is obviously good, since it's a straight upgrade over Sakuretsu Armor, and Burden of the Mighty was usually an annoying card to deal with because it actually gives a pretty significant attack reduction to all opponent's monsters. And Deep Diver was the worst of the three because it's just way too slow, unfortunately. For Stardust Accelerator, the three promos were Infernity Archfiend, Infernity Dwarf, and Infernity Guardian. Some of you may already know this, but the Infernity Archetype was a spectacular deck back in the day. Some Infernity cards are good, and some are very bad, and this here is a good example of that. Archfiend is clearly the best card in Infernity decks and is still limited to this day, while Dwarf and Guardian are some of the Archetype's weaker cards. For Reverse of Arcadia, the three promos were Samurai Sword Baron, Stygian Security, and Stygian Sergeants. Stygians were another 5D's archetype, but these two didn't really ever see too much play, and Samurai Sword Baron clearly has a very underwhelming effect, so there's not much to say here with these. And for Over the Nexus, the three promos were Necro Floor, Sorcerer de Floor, and Z1. The Floor cards were an odd engine to say the least, because it requires specifically effect destruction for Necro Floor to go off, and Z1 has a very specific trigger and all that for not even a very useful effect, just more and more to keep adding to the underwhelming promo cards. Now I'll go over the Tag Force games, which were all released for the PlayStation Portable, and they are as follows. Yu-Gi-Oh! GX Tag Force, Yu-Gi-Oh! GX Tag Force 2, Yu-Gi-Oh! 5D's Tag Force 4, Yu-Gi-Oh! 5D's Tag Force 5, and Yu-Gi-Oh! GX The Beginning of Destiny, which is known as Tag Force Evolution internationally. Oh, and this is the only one that's with the PlayStation 2 and not the PlayStation Portable. And no, I didn't miss Tag Force 3. Tag Force 3, 6, and Arc V Tag Force were actually never released in North America. But let's talk about the promos. For Tag Force 1, the three promos were Phantom Beast Cross Wing, Phantom Beast Wild Horn, and Phantom Beast Thunder Pegasus. There's two things I have to say here. The first is a clarification that despite these cards having the phrase Phantom Beast in their name, they are completely separate from the Mecha Phantom Beast archetype. The second is that if you know anything about Yu-Gi-Oh! archetypes, you'd probably know that this Phantom Beast archetype is one of the smallest and also worst archetypes in Yu-Gi-Oh! history. Looking at their effects makes this apparent very quickly. For Tag Force Evolution, the three promos were Nurse Reficule the Fallen One, which was eventually changed to Dark Lord Nurse Reficule, Dark Here, and Brutal Potion. All three are part of the Nurse Burn deck strategy where you have Nurse Reficule on the field or a car like Bad Reaction to Samochi, and then you can do brutal amounts of damage to the opponent. It's a fun deck that's occasionally been to a few top spots in some regional tournaments, but it's definitely nothing overly competitive. For Tag Force 2, the three promos were Mad Reloader, Dark Bribe, and Chaos Burst. Mad Reloader has an interesting hand fixer effect, but it's a bit too hard to trigger it sometimes. Chaos Burst is just odd because it's largely overshadowed by older battle traps such as Sakuretsu Armor or Widespread Ruin. And Dark Bribe is an iconic counter trap card but it's generally outclassed by others such as Solemn Judgment, because generally paying half your life points is much better than giving your opponent a free draw. Judgment can also negate summons, whereas Dark Bribe cannot. For Tag Force 4, the three promos were Warm Worm, Worm Bait, and Regretful Rebirth. Warm Worm is part of mill decks and has occasionally seen some success in those types of decks. Wormbait honestly should have been a quick play so you can avoid its drawback if you could have activated it in your opponent's turn, and Regretful Rebirth is probably one of the weak reborning cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! So it's not good. For Tag Force 5, the three promos were Floor Synchron, Chevalier de Floor, and Liberty at Last. Floor Synchron is one of the weaker Synchron monsters. Chevalier de Floor is odd because they somehow thought its effect would be too broken if you could use its negate on your opponent's turn, so they made it only usable on your own turn. 
which is really weird and questionable. And Liberty at last is a pretty nice form of monster removal, but the difficulty is triggering it sometimes, but overall it's a pretty decent card. The next game is Yu-Gi-Oh! 5D's Wheelie Breakers, released in May 19, 2009 for the Nintendo Wii. The three promos for this game were Supersonic Skull Flame, Skull Flame, and Burning Skull Head. These three cards are supposed to work together for a neat little combo, which surprisingly actually worked kind of well back in the day. It wasn't anything meta-relevant, but it was definitely formidable at casual level or even at local tournaments. The next game is Yu-Gi-Oh! 5D's Dual Transfer, released on December 7, 2010. The three promos for the game were Ape Fighter, Close Force, and Roaring Earth. These are basically beast support cards, and they weren't bad, but also not great. Close Forest does have a unique floodgate effect while potentially providing beast monsters a huge and significant attack boost, so it was pretty good back in the day in some specific ways. And the final game on the list is Yu-Gi-Oh! Legacy of the Duelists Link Evolution, released on April 25th, 2019 for the Switch. This was about 9 years with no promo cards released in North America. The three promo cards for this game were Progleo, Microcoder, and Cyanet Codec. These are generally just Code Talker and or Cybers type support cards which have some use in some ways, but nothing overpowering by any means. After all, this game is called Link Evolution by promoting newly released Link monsters at the time of the game's release, so it does make sense in a way. And that is it for the promo cards. As a quick reminder, this video covered video game promo cards for the North American region. I understand that some games got a physical release for other regions, even other English-speaking regions such as many European nations. And with the physical release, they got promo cards as well, such as Yu-Gi-Oh! GX Card Almanac or Yu-Gi-Oh! Zexel World Duel Carnival. But these games were digital only in North America, so while it's possible to find English-language promo cards of these games due to European versions of these games, note that these promo cards never had an actual official North American release, because you can't release promo cards in a digital-only game. Anyway, I'd love to know what some of your favorite video game promo cards are, and if you still have some of them, and if they're in great condition, or maybe not so good condition. As always, don't forget to leave a like, comment, subscribe, and share with your friends if you enjoyed this video. See you in the next history video!